Hello, this is ASAP USMLE, and today we're going to make spinal cord lesions make sense in just a few minutes. But first, we need to understand the cross-sectional anatomy of the spinal cord. Assuming you're familiar with the functions of the tracts, we will mainly focus on their location. Anterolaterally, here in the front and on the sides, we can find the cortical spinal tract, which carries upper motor neurons, the anterior horn cells carrying lower motor neurons, and the spinothalamic tract carrying sensation of pain, temperature, and crude touch. In the posterior side, we have mainly the dorsal columns carrying sensation of vibration, proprioception, and light touch. Now let's review the symptoms of upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. To keep it simple, I like to think of upper motor neuron symptoms as going up and about, hyperreflexia, the toes going up in positive Babinski, standing up when you're choking, and weight loss from lifting weights just to think of the gym. Similarly, think of lower motor neuron symptoms as passive, muscle atrophy because you're not moving and your muscles are wasting, and fasciculations which are small and non-purposeful movements. Once you know the location and function of these tracts, you can easily figure out the clinical findings. Here are some examples. Anterior cord syndrome. As the name suggests, only the posterior cord is unaffected, meaning the dorsal column. Everything else is. Since the injury is bilateral, the symptoms will be bilateral as well, and they will start at the level of the lesion. So you will have the symptoms of the cortical spinal, anterior horn cells, and spinothalamic tracts. Moving on to complete transection, this one is pretty straightforward. Your entire spinal cord is affected, meaning you will lose everything, sensation and motor, bilaterally, at the level of the lesion and below. Brown's cord is the most complicated, but it's about to make sense. We have an injury affecting exactly half of the cord. Remember that cortical spinal tract crosses at the medulla all the way up in the brainstem, so the symptoms will be ipsilateral anywhere in the cord, at the level of the lesion. The dorsal column also crosses at the brainstem, so symptoms will again be ipsilateral. Now, spinothalamic tract is the tricky part, as it gives contralateral symptoms starting two levels below the lesion. Here's why. Remember that this tract crosses in the spinal cord, two levels above. So let me demonstrate. Here we have an individual who has an injury on the left side of L1. Right side and left side on the individual, right side and left side on his spinal cord. So let's go ahead and take a lesion on his right side, representing L3. I know the dermatome is lower, but let's just pretend. So we take that lesion ipsilaterally from the right side to the right side at L3. Now we're gonna go up two levels, one, two, and we're gonna attempt to cross. We can't, there's a lesion. Therefore, L3 will have symptoms. But if we go to L2, as it comes, it goes one, two, and then it crosses. See how it already bypassed the lesion. Same happens for L1. So the level of the lesion and the level below, contralaterally speaking, are unaffected, whereas L3 and below are affected. So in summary, at the level of the lesion, we will have ipsilateral cortical spinal and dorsal column symptoms starting at the lesion down, whereas spinothalamic symptoms will be contralateral and starting two levels below the lesion. You may be wondering why is it that in anterior cord syndrome, the spinothalamic tract lesions do not start two levels below. This is because both of them are affected, so it does not matter the direction it's coming from, it will not be able to bypass the injury. So you will have bilateral symptoms starting at the level of the lesion. So that is it for classic spinal cord lesions. Thank you for watching. I hope it was helpful. Good luck studying. Good luck on your exams. And I'll see you on the next one. Bye.